Alrighty, welcome to the program. It's good afternoon, Ghana, and we're preparing towards uh, the weekend when the MPP is gathering to elect its new phase of national executives, and that's uh, this group of people are going to lead the party to attempt to break the eight come the next elections. Now, uh, today on the program, we have Charles uh, Nana Benyibisu, uh, who is the a presidential staffer. For now, that's, that's the title I think I'll... I'll put on him. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, Erica Mwakuchum, who is also aspiring national uh, organizer for the MPP. Both are already with me in the studio. Nana, you're welcome. Good afternoon to you. And uh, Eric, you're welcome as well. Good afternoon to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. So um, today, the Dankwa Institute is holding a what it calls leadership summit. And that is organized especially for the youth organizers aspiring or aspirants. So the youth organizer aspirants, uh, I think four of them are all programmed to be on the bill this afternoon. Latest by four, it should start at the premises of the Dankwa Institute. Metro TV will be there and we'll be bringing you details of what will happen there. And then later on, we'll also bring you a full you know, telecast of what really happened so that you can make an informed choice as far as the youth organizers are concerned. Listen to them and see if you can have the best choice from this summit that's being organized by the DI. Let's take a breather. When we come back, we'll go straight into the surprises, the shockers, uh, the tiredness, the uh, getting ready for being voted for or against. We'll be back shortly. All right, you're welcome back to Good Afternoon, Ghana. So this afternoon, we are with Charles Nabeni Bisu, who was running for one of the offices of the national executive positions. But news reached out this afternoon that he has stepped down. Um, we tried reaching him earlier, we weren't getting it, but thank God he's with us. Eric Amwakuchum is still hopeful that he can grab the position of the national organizer for the MPP. So he is still in the race. So I have two different, maybe, personalities with me uh, on the platform. Welcome once again, gentlemen, and uh, good afternoon to you. Eric, like, I, I, no, let me start with you, because you, you have given us some hot news. <laughs> <laughs> You've served us something really hot. What <laughs> happened to you? Okay. Thank you, and good afternoon to your listeners. Nothing happened, really. I, um, I followed um, the procedure keenly. Um, I've been involved, I've been an actor. Um, it's three days to the elections. And I looked at it and I thought, okay, um, the six of us contesting for that position, the general secretary position. And then going through the vetting and all that, we all qualify and there's go only going to be one general secretary. And there are other areas within the party within which I can offer my help. I've done it before. In 2010, I contested in the parliamentary primaries in the Hunter West and I lost. And then during the court case in 2012, I sat back and then saw a lot of gaps within the party. Then I offered myself to become the general secretary of the party. And then through that, we won power. So now we are at a crossroads, um, looking at the turbulence within the country and all that. You've seen ministers going out there to explain why we've gone to IMF. And so there's a whole lot that we have to do. So we cannot all be chasing uh, one position and then uh, leave um, certain gaps behind it. So, I thought I have been communicating for the party, and so I, I'll carry on doing that. And whoever wins, um, I can offer my support uh, to whoever wins. Uh, like I said, um, maybe it's a joke, but then even if um, K. Jinfua wins and he asks me to become the deputy women's organizer, that's a job for the party. The most important thing for me is for us to uh, go beyond um, the next cycle, which is a four year term uh, that's ahead of us, and that's 2024. So, I, I mean, the first time we heard, uh, that was even before we went on news beats mm. to cast the news. Yeah. And then I, I said, has it been paid off to get out of the race? <laughs> no, I haven't been paid off. Um, why, um, why should somebody pay me off? I mean, um, the rules um, of engagement that you can always uh, withdraw or opt out. And no, somebody shouldn't induce me because I have a political um, career ahead of me as well. Yeah. And so going for somebody's money 
um, to, um, I'm in the same vein advising delegates to actually vote with their conscience. If somebody had induced me, then I would have stated that a certain person should be voted for. But I said, all the candidates are equally qualified. Whoever wins, I'm going to help that person. So nobody has actually induced me or spoken to me. What factor really pushed you out? Name that one factor. No, like I said, I mean, I mean, the political party gives birth to the government. I've been in government before as a presidential staffer and seen what is happening with two years into an elections. Um, there are other people who are not party officers who can offer a lot to the party. I've done that in the past. At the moment, uh, with my experience, I mean, amongst those who I'm in contesting, apart from John Boyd, who is the incumbent, I, I think that I stand to, I, I stood tall. Um, eight, uh, eight years as a regional secretary, eight years as a member of the National Council, presidential staffer, former chairman in Northampton, UK. So um, internationally, locally, and I've done what you have I, it all. Exactly. I communicate for the party. So, And so I thought to myself that I do not have to be the general secretary alone to help the party or to make an impact. But then you it, didn't know that before you got into the race. I, I mean, knew. I remember I had a one-on-one -on -one with you, yeah. and I was glad to have seen that, well, with all the controversy surrounding Nana Bisu, yes. he's still pushing on. Yes. So you don't always have to be, um, I mean, an officer to work for the party. Yes. Um, decisions are made based on the exigency of time. When I went in for the form through vetting and all that, at the time, we didn't have the IMF issue, which were different scenarios as opposed to the time that NDC were in. Mm -hmm. um, Ghanaians are not happy with what is going on. We need to uh, explain things to the, them that it is based on what is happening in, on the international stage and all that. And you, you realize that our communication as a party, yes, you cannot get communication 100%, but our communication hasn't gone down well and we're always defending um, the exactly. party. So I can come in and also help the party with what, with what I've been doing over the past few years. So but it's easier when you are in office, then you get to decide and make decisions that would lead the uh, uh, impl implementation of the no, All the time that I have been communicating, I was in the general secretary, but then I was still communicating it. It, it helps the party um, to have, um, okay, a general secretary who communicates well, but then when we have other people who can communicate as well, then the more the better. So I, um, I made the decision not because I felt that I cannot win or anything like that, mm. I know that I'm competent. I've done eight years in the Western region. Um, we still are in the lead in the Western region. Um, when Before I came in as a regional secretary, we had eight seats and this year 18. But then um, when I became regional secretary, we won 16 and NDC has been in the negative. It's not because of that. I just want to offer myself somewhere else. Um, the decision was based on the fact that, yes, there's five or six of us going for that position. Anybody can win the position. Yes, yeah, so of course, there were top three, uh, myself. Um, you the thinly, two thinly stretched, yes. I think? No. I thought that no, there were three leading, uh, uh, three of us leading, including the, um, the incumbent, okay. yeah. So it could be anybody's game. So at this point in time, why don't I also, okay, offer myself an opt-out and then help whoever wins. And then in my withdrawal letter, I stated the things that I wanted to do for the party. So it's obvious that I still want to help the party so they can take that and work with that. Being the originator of those ideas, if the person calls me, I'll help that person. But in the meantime, whilst ministers have left the offices to go out there on radio stations to communicate for the party and government, I think I can do the same. Eric, let me, let me come to you. What do you make of, how do you react to a sudden decision to step down or get out of the race or I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I can only wish uh, him well. I mean, this is a very tough, arduous process. Mm. And um, for me, for anybody to even have the courage to go all the way through, to go through Burton and traverse the yeah. length and breadth of this country yeah. to ask for votes. Mm needs commendation. It's, it's not for the faint-hearted. And um, Wait, there are a lot of people... Hold on there. How much did you spend in your campaign, Charles? 
Do I have possible answers that I can choose from? Yeah. Which are the other possible answers? Um, <laughs> give us a, I think answers, the possible answers will be between the facts and average. <laughs> no, I mean, you cannot quantify how much you've spent. But you can you have are a... going out there, meeting people and all that. So I cannot put a figure on it. I mean, we do it all the time. Even during communication, when you go to um, out there communicating for the party, you use your fuel a little. You're not, it's not paid for. I'm not, so, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about campaign specific. That, that's what I'm saying. It was a continuous thing for me. So I cannot name a figure. Yes, I've, I, it maybe it went up. Uh, then it means that I'm going for a position that I would have to accrue or um, get that money back. So I started counting. What I, no, that's not what I do. Because I, every time over the years, I've gone to radio stations. You're too rich to calculate what you're spending. No, I've, I'm not saying I'm too rich. But then if you try to calculate it, then you start thinking about it, then you don't have to, you would not even end up working for the party. It doesn't really matter if uh, people think that it's because you are going for the position for money and you're not. Mm -hmm. it, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, as a businessman, your type, I'm yeah. sure that you would even have an estimate or a budget mm -hmm. to whatever project you pursue. The politics is so, like, you know, when you go to the chief's palace, and then you do donations, you don't go for receipt. That's how politics is. So you don't actually quantify how much you spend on certain things. But you know how much you give the chiefs? Yes, you know, but do you want me to mention how much I give no. a chief? Exactly. So if I go out there and then I'm talking politics and I give something to a party person. Oh, but you may mention if you want to. No, I, I don't you. want to mention an amount, no. So you can't give me an estimate of how much you spent in total? Then I have to start from the time I contested as a regional secretary. And that's over eight years. And then the, this program is for just an hour, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back to Eric. <laughs> well, so, so like I was saying, it's a, it's a very uh, adult uh, process. And um, of course, I mean, he has his own reasons. Uh, these are legitimate reasons. Um, but it all builds up to being part of the process. Because it's a conversation. This is a political party. I think that... Uh, Stopping short of sounding academic. Sometimes we're not very good at mm -hmm. these things, whereby mm -hmm. I'm sure that even as we go along, someone should be collating all the various ideas that people are preferring mm -hmm. so that once the dust settles, mm -hmm. right, you can find value in some of these conversations yeah. and, and the propositions mm -hmm. that people make. But because it's a, it's a contest, uh, what tends to happen is that uh, the focus always goes to <clears throat> who wins, and sometimes it's not even about the winning. You can have someone win by with 25 or 30 percent of the votes, and 70 percent of the people do not actually agree or feel that that particular individual mm -hmm. is the best candidate. But this mm -hmm. is first past the post. So as a political process or like a democratic process, uh, there has to be some kind of value mm -hmm. in the conversations that we are having, the, the feedback that you actually get from the the party people when you get mm. to the ground. And if, even for my own personal experiences, a uh, conversation that you have somewhere in my constituency, Fantiaqua South, is totally different from one in Pusiga, right? Mm. And these mm. are all Ghanaians. These are people who live in the same jurisdiction. But you also get a certain in inclination that this whole cliche that politics is local is actually the case. You know, so even all those people contesting these elections, I believe strongly that there's some kind of value in making sure that whoever wins is magnanimous enough to be able to tap into these individuals. Because where else would you get such talent from in terms mm. of a, a certain aggregation of people mm. who are interested in a, a certain cause? Yeah. And I believe that if we're able to do that, you would find out that uh, as we go along into the next elections, right, once you're able to harness this human capital that we have as a political party, it will serve us better. So, I mean, he's, 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 my, he's my brother. I mean, there's no uh, doubt we've been that in this his game for a very long time in the trenches for a long rich, time. some rich, richness and added some value to the contest. It was, I mean, interesting to find that Charles Bissu was in the race. When I first got to know that he was in the race, yeah, it same was here. interesting. I mean, yeah. So him dropping out was like, oh, it's like one leg of the chair is broken. Well, I mean, but the <laughs> thing is that he still has a lot to offer. I mean, mm. this, there's no, mm -hmm. this is, it's part of the process. It's like an ongoing Why thing. are you both pretending this is normal? It's not normal. 
No, but it's it's a political process. Yes, and but so you he, you don't you don't um, get out of the race and say, oh well, I can still contribute without. And, people, it, and it's as though there's the, no reason. He just thought people, that there are about ten people, twenty people. I think it's normal for me to step down, but it's not. There were people who, <laughs> per to the vetting process, had their names all over the place. They couldn't yeah. go and pick up phones. Yeah, there are people who would are perennial also runs. They would always run, but never run. I mean, it happens all the time. There are people who would talk a good game, but when it comes mm. to yeah. which comes to show, they will not be found. We, yeah. We've seen people like that. So yeah. all I'm saying is that for him to actually put himself <laughs> up, and this thing comes with a lot of scrutiny. You know, you need to basically um, allow yourself to be scrutinized and, you know, under a microscope, for example, because you are going for uh, and even an internal contest. And I would commend him any day. And we have been in the trenches for a very long time, mm -hmm. you know. And, I mean, he, he was um, Western Regional Secretary. I remember when we went to the by-elections yeah, almost I mean, eight years ago in Amanfi West and the kind of role that he played and all that. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're in a political, uh, if you like, season, sometimes we don't like to give plaudits to our own, mm -mm. you know? It's almost as if that like a, a winner takes all cutthroat mm -mm -mm. environment. But the kind of work that he has done in the Western region needs to be commended. So as almost, almost everybody, he was talking about communication. There are guys that we were in the trenches with in opposition. Mm. And to date, we are in power, but these guys still uh, are, are not being mm. appreciated properly or they, they feel that they've been neglected. Yeah. We need to go back and mm -hmm. find these people and harness their potential and ensure that this whole conversation around apathy and people disgruntled and all that are things that we can fix internally if we're minded by that. And I mean, I think that within the next few months, I'm sure that he has something else up his sleeve uh, <laughs> that he would want to do. How about you? I mean, I know you have also gotten to a point where you, you think that, well, I don't think I want to spend any more money, but I want to work towards until the last day. Let's see how it all goes. Have you gotten to a point where you also... <laughs> but why, are you making it sound like it's about money? No, that's, no. Not, the, that's not how we started it. No, I'm no, not making it about money. No, but that's not how we started it. But you need money to do it, don't yes, you? Yes, but we haven't said money was the problem. I'll tell you... Yeah, but if he says that, then he has to explain okay. how yeah, that I works. Said that, yeah. All I'm saying is that, <laughs> yeah. All, all, maybe you haven't, yes, but maybe haven't you have. All, okay, go it's ahead. very important that we contextualize this conversation. This is an internal contest. I am putting myself up to serve the party. I have served the party in many, I've been a first vice chair in my constituency. Yeah. I've communicated for the party. I have volunteered, I've done strategy opposition, in government, and all that, I will continue to serve. I believe that over the period, in the last eight years or so, by either certain indirect reasons, for example, when uh, the current general secretary was national organizer, he became general secretary. There's a, a huge gap that was left behind, and we ca have to be candid with ourselves. That happened. Then the current national organizer, after a while, um, was given another opportunity to go serve the country. So he's now a, a chief executive somewhere. So there's also a gap. Now, as a party man, right, you need to look, I could have contested anything, you, you understand, but you need to look at the, the, the dynamics and all the issues that is bedeviling the party and even as a country, and you want to, want to fix yourself in a position that you make like more impact. You'll be able to impact positively and make sure that all the cocks are put together to ensure that the party is strong. And that is exactly what I've put myself up for. Beyond that would be asking too much. You know, so because at the end of the day, I believe that there's always some kind of uh, wisdom in the decisions that are taken by the collective, which is the majority. And that's a democracy. That's what we agree that we want to be governed by. So I would sit, not sit here and never question the judgment of the delegates who are going to vote. I mean, they are going to vote. They are going to make the decision as to who should lead them as national leadership. These are decisions that we will all live and die by. Yeah. You understand? So I shouldn't take it 
personal. And it is not a do or die affair for me. The very next day, I'm sure after Saturday, Sunday, Monday, on Tuesday or Wednesday, if you call me to come and sit here and defend the party, I will come and I'll do it. And I have continued to do that, right? So the decision to lead does not sit with me. The decision to lead sits with the people who are going to cast uh. the votes, right? And I believe strongly that they, their, their, their judgment cannot be questioned, whichever way you look at it. I know that once we start this process, there are all sorts of insinuations and all of those things, but if all the issues that we have gone to the country and listened to the party people talk about, if they feel so strongly about them, and you know, you need to graduate these uh, expectations, right? If they feel so strongly by them, they will make the decision that best suits them come Saturday. And I would go by that decision any day. You, I know you've been in meetings, I mean, uh, you know, in preparation towards the weekend. How has it been so far, the organizing committee and uh, 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 colleague aspirants and everybody? How has, I know sometimes there can be backroom wranglings or boardroom wranglings. What has happened so far with your meetings? I mean, this wouldn't have been a political party if uh, you're going into a process like this and people will not have reason to have higher expectations of whoever is being put in charge. Thus far, as far as I'm concerned, the process has been smooth. Uh, of course, there are issues that would have to be ironed out because whatever happens on Saturday would be a clear indication of how ready we are as a political party to prosecute the 2024 elections. And everybody who is part of the process should be minded by that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I believe that, I mean, uh, you know, sober heads will prevail. People will start appreciating the fact that this is not just an election. The Ghanaian people are watching us. The Ghanaian right. people have and you higher are in government. expectations yeah. of us. And we are in government. And it will be a total disservice to the conscience of the Ghanaian people if on Saturday, either by acts of omission or commissions, there's some kind of chaos because we haven't for ourselves, being able to follow the process or being uh, able to present a level playing field for everybody. And this is an admonishment to even some of us who are aspirants who are in the process that whatever it is that you do today has future implications, right? And I, I'm sure that whoever is in charge of the process will be minded by that. And I have every confidence that, of course, there are one, one issue here or the other where people want clear directions on that and also want to be sure that there's clarity going forward with issues to do with the register and Tescon and proxy. I mean, I'm not shy to say it. And yeah. these are well, that's, that's one that actually came up because... Yeah, these are contentious. Uh, what's his name? Because because youth organizer, um, Guma. Youth organizer, Hopeful. Yeah. Mm. yeah, he also came out with one release and it was addressed to the committee uh, to trash out the issues concerning Tetscon and the register that mm. had come up, I think, in one of your meetings. Okay. And I thought the issues he raised were quite uh, a they lot. Just, yes. But you see, apart from that, you also, you know, we are a political party, right? So we don't solve our issues on the outside. in public. We don't do that on, med in, on media platforms and all that. And the channels have actually been opened for people to who address your concerns. have certain things that they, they are unhappy about and to express their disquiet and all that. And I'm confident that as we speak, uh, there's no indication that these uh, petitions are not going to be given the attention that it, it requires. I, uh, Charles, I'm sure you, you partook in some of the meetings. Yeah. What, what are some of the issues you think must be worked on as soon as possible before we, we go into the election? Oh, for me, um, it's just like any other elections. Um, when um, before, prior to the elections, the issues with albums and all that, that's why we're all talking about um, digitizing them and then making sure that we have um, um, the right album. I've received the album. Um, I've gone through them. Um, people are talking about Tesco and all that. Um, I think the committee has met with candidates and 
Um, we went through that, and these issues are being addressed so that each and everyone will be happy before the, the, the election. The Tescon situation is coming across, at least with us in the media, mm -hmm. as being used as a rigging machinery. Because we monitored from beginning, from where the primary started, all the mm. way through the regions yeah. and now, mm. national. And Tescon was, at, 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 especially at the regional uh, level, level, Tescon was constantly a problem across the country. I think, you see, um, they, they have to actually carry out a deeper introspection into that because where they say it's only the president that um, votes, so you're able to, I mean, have control over the president and the president falls under the uh, youth organizer, so the youth organizers manipulate that. I mean, we've had that in some regions. So I think they have I think to... it's rather the president or any other executive. Exactly. But when the president is there, I mean, he has the he first has option. To, yeah. no, but Charles, what's happening is that in certain instances, um, the process is such that people have been designated to vote on behalf of these uh, presidents. Presidents. Uh, institutions mm -hmm. other than the president. Yes. And because there's a certain lacuna there, which mm. says that, a the president or a representative. representative. The point here is that who makes that Decision. determination as to exactly. you are going to go and represent. And <laughs> yeah, so they, they yeah. are appointed regardless so, of yes, president. Yes, so we, we, being we are, around. This should not be a problem for a party like the MPP. No, that's what Some I'm saying. Convention no. should actually. Yeah, Eric, that's what I'm saying. That yeah. no, it shouldn't be a convention. It should, going forward, we should be clear on who is going to vote. If it's the president, if not the president, then maybe all the executives sit, cast the ballot, and, and choose then choose one person. When you do that, then that person who is going to vote, that's, is not going to vote for somebody who has manipulated him or her. That, that's what I'm saying. Like going forward, that's how it should be. Because if you're saying a representative, you're playing with what that word representative, then it means that the president can choose anybody outside of her, which is not true. Exactly. Yeah. Because if you come to me with that interpretation, I'm just going to, I mean, then you don't deserve to be the president. That's me. But I am saying that going forward, then within the executive, they can go in, cast a vote, choose one person. It doesn't have to be the president. So when you do that, by over the years, if the youth organizer or somebody has manipulated the president to vote for a certain candidate, it's not going to happen. Because who are, whom are you going to speak to? Because let's not forget that um, we induce them before the time comes. Because... It gets to a point that somebody partners the president from day one, knowing that it is the president who is going to vote. But if the president or whoever knows that they are going to cast the ballot, we're going to vote openly for Tescon, all Tescon members to openly vote and choose one person to go and then um, represent the institution, then that, those pro these problems wouldn't be happening. I think that's, for me, in my mind. Mm. Well, uh, why is this difficult? It's because a, because the constitution it's goes through a thorough uh, sort of discussion oh, but, but you see, before you make even decisions. Even now, general elections, then 2020. This kind of loop is very obvious. I mean, it's too obvious to be missed. Yeah, but you see, if, if our dispensation um, is what has made people's perception about elections in Ghana, when either to 1992, uh, before that, we'll be at the polling station and somebody will come and whisk the ballot box away. And then gradually that thing has been a thing of the past. Even 2024 elections, NDC are psyching this, uh, people that NDC and people try and rig the elections. So with elections, these things happen. But we as a party, we have evolved. Um, in this day and age, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have these problems. That's why I have confidence in the committee that th these things will be resolved. If the rule says president, then it must be president. A representative of the president, then it means that one of the executives. Yeah, but that determination has to be done by the institution. Exactly. Not someone outside exactly. no, of I the agree. institution. Otherwise, I, then it makes the process unfair. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That. So, so that it, it has to be an executive yeah. member within. It doesn't have to be anybody outside of the executives. Yes. You, you, because yes. if we if we say patrons, the council of patrons, council of um, elders, in the regions, I think five votes... But we have more than 10 patrons. So they, choose. they choose the five who go and then, and then they hold a meeting and say that these are the candidates that we are likely, um, we all prefer. So go and vote for us. So that is done quietly. And I think that should be applied from the test front. So let's now, um, I ha okay, I'm past 30 minutes. Getting into the elections, I've yeah. had people 
text me and accusing me of interviewing only the new faces that are coming up <laughs> within the executive positions. Oh, they want the old people. But the, world, the word old also, I mean, tells you that they're old, so the new executives as well. That person is right. <laughs> because they've been in the system for a while. So you want to oh, well. so talk about fresh things now, don't you? Well, but that's not what they meant. <laughs> I knew exactly what they meant. So um, I, I don't, you were a new face coming into the executive position. You were a new face until you dropped out. Do you support the old block or the new block? Or a mixture of the two? And what was the new block? And the old I don't know. Block. We new, all party new faces members. coming into. Oh. You know, sometimes you you want fresh energy, you want fresh things, and I think with a couple of interviews I've conducted with a one on one, uh, the uh, underlining factor has been you've lost touch with grassroots. Yes. So we we can. I mean, I'm not for a thing of the old guard or new guard. What I am competence is the most important thing. Somebody might be coming in now. And not be competent. Eric, I've worked with him in I mean, few years. I know what he did during the by elections and all that. So if I have to vouch for him any day, I will. You understand? But then if you're saying that the person has been there for a longer period, so the person cannot perform, no. I understand people talking about experience here and there. You can mm -hmm. you can be on the job for so many years and then doing bad things all the time. That's still an experience in doing bad things, mm -hmm. isn't it? And we can have people come in and do new things. So Let's bring the word competence to the forefront. That I am for it, you see. And then going in, once we win this, uh, we finish on Saturday, I want to see um, a reinvigorated um, executives who um, will keep in touch with the grassroots. Because at, the, at this point in time, people are saying there's detachment. Uh, the government is detached from the party and we are detached from the grassroots. All right. These are the things that we have to work on. That's why I'm happy that you can see ministers like Alan Chamantin, Kujo Ponkruma, all of them going out there to the radio stations to speak to people. You realize that when they, since they started doing that, this IMF thing, people have understood that, that better. Should we have done that years before? Before. Because I kept, I told somebody, um, I, I suggested to somebody in the party that um, when I come in as the general secretary, there has to be something outside of what Kujo Ponkruma does. There has to be time with the minister. So 30 minutes in the radio station for all the ministers in every week, in a week, so that we actually speak to the Ghanaian people as to what is happening in our ministries and the agencies. So I'm happy this thing has come now. The ministers are doing it, so we should continue doing that. Because if the minister is there and he's not coming out to speak, we do the press briefing, oh, okay, but... You know communication, sometimes you have to trick it a bit and then for people to listen to you. So um, the dynamism coming from Kujo Pong Krumen's area is good for me. It's a breath of fresh air, but I think that we have to communicate. And then our body posture, you know, I've seen some of our communicators going out there and being aggressive. To, I, I'm not, I, I don't want, at this point in time, you don't have to be aggressive because a hungry man is an angry man. Uh, Kofi Bento actually thinks that the government is having a posture of that of a pr proud person or pride. No, no, it's not the government. I'm talking about too individuals. Much pride. But we, we, are, we, we are all part of the government. Yeah, so. but the individual speaks on behalf of government. So when that posture comes, it comes, uh, it's not even... So tell him to write about the it's two not of going us. To, people are not going to <laughs> Tell him to write about the two of us. You see, yeah. he's taking somebody who um, communicates aggressively and then, and then said, it's saying it's the government. He's got two examples here now. You understand? Let's use that one. What, what I'm trying to say is that, yes, I've seen some of our lot going out there to aggressively defend the government. You can actually put your case across nicely because our culture, when you're communicating, you need to look at the culture of the Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. Aggressiveness is not part of us. There are certain cultures or really um, tribes in Ghana that aggressiveness, like maybe the Ghana. Okay, mm -hmm. the gas. It's not because they're being aggressive. That's the posture. So when you're communicating in the gas community, there's a way that you actually communicate. The ever community and all that. And then when you're actually talking to the whole world, there's a certain posture. At this point in time, Ghanaians are expecting a lot from the government. Um, the Ukraine war, the um, the, um, the COVID, recent COVID, and all that. So you need to explain it to people. That person is not happy. The money is not flowing. So that person is not even ready to listen to you. And then you go with that aggressive stance. No, it doesn't work. 
you need to take your time and then plead with the person and explain yourself to the person. And I believe they'll hear us. So, so there's a, a, a breaking story coming through from the uh, Joint Health Sector Unions and Professional Association. It's just been sent to me. It says that the joint press release on demand <coughs> for 20% cost of living allowance COLA by Joint Health Sector Unions. And um, I think I was talking to one doctor at dawn today and he indicated that they were going into a meeting and will send us a release shortly. And I think that's why this release has just come in. So it's the Ghana Medical Association, the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association, Health Services Workers Union of TUC, and then also Ghana and Government and Hospital Pharmacists Association. Um, the the, the write-up says that the Ghana Medical Association, the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association, Health Service Workers Unions and Government uh, and Hospital Pharmacists Association being constituent members of organized labor made a request to government for 20% cost of living allowance as a COLA for our members in the light of the prevailing difficult uh, economic situation in the country. Now, unfortunately, like other members, of organized labor, we are yet to receive a favorable response from government. We have, we've had hoped, uh, we had hoped that the meeting convened by government with organized labor on 12 of July 2022, which was yesterday, would have resolved the issue. But the meeting failed to achieve its objective. Now we are therefore serving notice to government uh, as an employer that if by 22nd of July 2022, the negotiations on COLA is not completed, the aforementioned health sectors, uh, the sector unions, will have no other choice than to embark on a series of actions as spelled out below, which will in no doubt disturb the industrial harmony within the health sector. So 25th to 27th July, wearing of red, uh, arms, wristbands, and all health in all health facilities. 28 to 31st, 2022, withdrawal of outpatient department services. 1st August 2022, withdrawal of OPD and inpatient services. And then, uh, okay, so those are the three levels of demonstrations. Yes, they will go through if government fails to respond to them by the 22nd of July, 2022. So more pressure for government, I guess. I'm sorry, this one just came through. I had to put it across. <laughs> I had to put it across. That is so, like, that's yeah. an ambush. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I'm I would sorry. say that... Um, are, are you responding to this? You, uh, you asked me. Or that's fine. Oh, okay, go ahead. What do you want to say to it? No, I, I would say that I, I, I empathize with workers across the country. And um, nobody would sit here and discount the challenges that uh, workers would have to go through as a result of all sort of uh, factors. Uh, what I would caution is that, you know, there's this famous uh, fable, it's called Aesop's Fable. You know the, uh, the story of the man that killed the, the bird that laid a golden egg? And so we have to be careful. I mean, government has an onerous responsibility. I think that the ultimate responsibility lies with government. But it can never happen with government alone. You need some kind of concerted uh, collaboration between government and the various uh, labor unions to find sometimes what you do is that you need to calibrate it in such a way that you have short, medium, <clears throat> and long-term uh, solutions to some of these uh, issues so that it doesn't prolong to a point where now it brings the entire country also to a halt. Then it starts affecting productivity and then it's a ripple effect. So the very thing that, for example, we were uh, demonstrating about trying to uh, s s stop actually has been exacerbated by our actions. You understand? So can you imagine... Um, a certain lack of productivity across the country over an extended period. I mean, just a, a four-week or six-week lockdown basically had serious repercussions, which we're still trying to deal with and all that. So I think that it's gotten to the point where there has to be a very uh, 
sometimes dispassionate conversation around the table, but finding solutions to these things, short term, medium and long term, and also coming to the table with a certain mindset that you are not coming to have an intransigent position. You understand? So we expect, the expectation is that government is going to negotiate in good faith, the labor unions are going to negotiate in good faith, and then we can find some immediate wins, some low-hanging uh, uh, fruits. You know, one of the things, I mean, I, I think I'm being... For low-hanging yeah, fruits. Yeah, a bit, a bit critical of some of the, even the technocrats in the, in, in the whole uh, conversation is that we're a bit reactive. You know, I mean, some of these things can be dealt with in earnest so that we don't even get to this point. We're a bit reactive. And then also, we have to get to the point where we have to understand where the labor unions are coming from, be empathetic to their cause, and also be very open and transparent to them to give them an indication of what the issues are. And I believe that once we do that and we try to negotiate in good faith, we would forestall some of these challenges, and we can move on. I, I, I don't know what to think about this. Chrissy Pratt was on Good Morning Ghana, I remember. He actually said that this looks like what happened in the 1970s is repeating itself, where you have one union going on strike in difficult times, and then it has a replic uh, replicating effect the copycat. on all yeah. others. <laughs> so I don't know if that's exactly what's happening. Let me take a breather. When we come back, we'll wrap up on us going to uh, the elections come this weekend. We hear that is, you're going to be voting in the evening. Who said that? I heard it. I'll be back shortly. <laughs> Welcome back. We're wrapping up on Good Afternoon Ghana. I still have Charles Bissu with me and also Eric Chum. Uh, Eric Amwaku Chum. <laughs> with me. And um, we, we are going to um, the elections on Saturday now. So what uh, should we expect? I heard that the voting was going to be starting in the evening. You are hearing too many things. <laughs> yeah, but it's my work. <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, well, so... Timetable is very simple. It's conference. Uh, the voting process is actually the last item on the, on the bill. Yeah. Uh, but normally, conference is meant to start at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, per meetings that I've been to and indications are that the, the arrangements are going to be done in a way that will allow for the smooth running of the process so that immediately we start. The Electoral Commission was actually present at the meeting, and they were of the view that if we go by that process within four hours, we should be done. And so, give and take, uh, I feel that after a couple of hours, after the 9 a.m. Uh, commencement, we should start voting mm -hmm. and pair. The arrangement that has been made, if it, everything goes uh, according to plan, all things being equal, uh, we should finish. I, I don't know where you got your <laughs> voting at night from. This is not a it's an election. It is not a... Because we're on a platform, I'll forgive you. All right, sure. I know yes. you know where I got it from. Where did you get it from? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't disclose my source on TV, so yeah. let's just move on. So, uh, Charles, how about you? What, what, should be, what should we be expecting? No, I, I expect us to go out there, comport ourselves, because the whole world is watching us. Um, eight years, um, we have that eight-year jinx to break. So whatever we do on Saturday, it's a preamble to us winning the election. So I, like I said, um, stated in my statement, I urge all the um, delegates to vote with your conscience. Um, it shouldn't be a thing of money crossing. Um, you shouldn't be. Are your supporters redirected to another candidate now? No. No, my statement said that they should use their conscience in voting. And I also stated that whoever wins, I'm going to support them. So they have the choice of um, who they support. I'm not going so to don't support anyone. If I'm going to vote, yes, um, I'll vote for somebody, but I haven't actually got thought through it. I'm going to look for somebody who's, um, I mean, programs or policies that he wanted uh, to bring out are like um, similar to mine. Then it means that we are like minded. So, so behind the scenes, you didn't tell your supporters to vote for? 
maybe Saturday I'll do that. Because if I'm going to vote and my supporters ask me whom I am going to vote for, I should tell them um, if they decide to vote for that person, yes. If they decide that they want otherwise, they have a superior argument, well, then I'll go with this. Year. Pardon? Justice Kudia. No, I haven't mentioned any name. Yeah, There's John Wedu, Justin Kudia, Oparianza, Musa Superior, and all that. And each of them has something to actually offer the party. So if you're looking for me to mention the name here for a headline... No, you have stepped down, so... No, but if you want a headline from me, you didn't get one. You're not going to get a headline from me. <laughs> I'm not seeking to... <laughs> no, no, you I'm not seeking to make headlines. No. I'm just, I mean, if you step down... I mean, there's, no. there's a little <clears throat> uh, disappointment for me. Uh, I would have thought that uh, I'm happy with the debate... Mm. that the youth organizers are going to understand. Oh, yeah, the, the one for the general secretaries and then the organizers. They would have done that I, for I'm everybody. trying so hard to get Dr. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because, because I spoke um, with her on Good Evening Ghana mm. and I asked why it is for only... But it's uh, a step. I, yes, I, I like exactly. The fact, that yeah, was her response yeah. that we've just started and then I think he, she thought that, interestingly, it would be good to start with the youth. Yes. And then maybe as they grow... They can you spread it out. No, no, it's a, it's a very interesting thing. I, I commend uh, uh, Danko Institute for that. Because, you see, one of the things that we are not very good at is debating. You know, and some people actually follow people. And you can ask them, what are these people standing for? And they will not even have one thing to say. But I think that even for the collective, as, as a country going forward and everything, there's something that we need to encourage across all the political parties at various levels of... Because even... Nowadays in school elections, they debate yeah, they, how much yeah, more for. In, in the law of yes, you understand. No, we we got text messages. Yes. When after that we yes. got text messages to say there was going to be a debate, debate. amongst the general secretaries. So we, I went out yes. there researching and actually practicing for it, and okay. never came to pass. Right. But then the youth organizers are doing that. Right. I think in future, um, we have to do that. But I do not think that when we do that, we have to do it in the open. For me for the whole world to see it. I think we need to do it before a certain panel. No, you can do it like a panel. Within the yeah. party. Yeah. Because we, at that point, a lot of things will be said. So if it goes out there, then it's going to actually it might affect the party. the party. So I would want us to do it, but with party elders. Right. And people right. So, so what's coming up uh, at 4.30 at the Dankwa Institute's premises is the uh, Youth Leadership Dialogue. That's how it's been captioned, Youth Leadership Dialogue. You may want to call it debate, but that's your own word. Yeah. So it's, it's among uh, Abanga, of course, uh, Salam Mustafa, Prince Kamal Guma, and also Michael Ose. Uh, Boating. And uh, the four are going to be meeting this afternoon, we hope. I was also hearing... And Eric doesn't like me here say that. One of them didn't want to come. <laughs> so uh, I'm hoping to see all four, you know. I don't think you're obliged to. I think it's uh, no, 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 it's no, not, not necessarily. It's but of course, it yeah. would just be nice. I mean. Yeah. So thank you, Eric Omakuchum. Thank you, thank Charles you. and Abin Yibisu for making time with me this afternoon. It has been good afternoon, Ghana. Uh, stick with us as we bring you all the updates from the quarters of the MPP in the build-up towards uh, the weekend for the national executive elections.